Sometimes gin makers do crazy things. In their pursuit of what gin can be, we see more and more unusual ingredients used in a gin. And in my collection, I have several gins that goes into this category. So this is my top five gin with unusual ingredients. Hi guys and welcome to High on Gin. Before we get to my top five list, let me get one thing straight. There is nothing wrong with using unusual ingredients in a gin. I mean, you can distill your old socks or your neighbor's annoying cat for that matter, and you can still call it a gin, as long as you follow a couple of ground rules. The definition of gin is pretty simple. I mean, it's a juniper flavored spirits based on a natural spirits of uh, agricultural origin. And the predominant flavor must of course be juniper, and the minimum bottle strength is uh, 37.5 for Europe and 40% ABV for the US. So, I mean, if you add juniper and you use the most common base alcohol and you keep the ABV above a certain level, you can call your spirit gin. And from here, you can go bonanza. The only thing that sets the, uh, the limit, well, it's your imagination. And that is exactly what these guys did. They, these master distillers that we, you're gonna see, they really used their imagination. So let's take a closer look at the five most unusual gins in my collection today. Number five. You know how you sometimes see announcement like, this is the most luxurious burger in the world, and you see that they have actually just added tons of white truffles and gold leaves and wrapped the burger in paper covered with Swarovski diamonds, and you think, but why? That doesn't really make it a delicious burger, only a very expensive one. And that is the thought that you can get when you think, gin with caviar. I mean, fish eggs in a gin. No way in right? But you know what? This really makes sense. It's actually an ingenious gin that, with its light thickness and slight saltiness, works amazingly with the fresh botanicals. This gin, it's made in um, cooperation between the crazy guys from Radius Distillery in the southern parts of Sealand here in Denmark and the owners of the company called Ron, a Copenhagen-based company specializing in high-end caviar. And the combination of uh, Baeri caviar, the juniper, cherville, uh, green anise, uh, uh, apples, uh, lemon thyme, it simply makes a great gin. And maybe the secret lies in the fact that the caviar is not overpowering the botanicals, but adds this overall salty expression and feel to this gin. And kind of like when you, when you use uh, seaweed in a, in a gin. So this could very well be the ultimate gin for New Year's Eve. If you're having caviar, forget about vodka, forget about champagne, up your game with Bayeri caviar. Number four. So what do you do if you want to do a gin based on uh, only local botanicals and you live on a small island in Denmark without any citrus fruits like oranges and lemons and you really want that citrus feeling in your gin? Well, you have to get creative. And that is exactly what Sam's Island Distillery did when they uh, went into the forest and they armed themselves with a homemade apparatus and started collecting, or uh, you would say, sucking up these orange flavored jet ants. Yes, it's a cumbersome uh, task, uh, but you know, they, um, when, when you collect these, these ants and when you smell them and taste them, you get this amazing feeling of grated orange peel. And one thing that the boys from Sam's Island Distillery had to learn was how to handle live ants when you try to put them in your vapor basket in your pot still. 
And as far as I've heard, it was the world famous chef uh, René Redzepi from the restaurant Noma who gave them the tip to freeze the ants slightly before using them. So they didn't go everywhere in the distillery. So this is another gin that, despite its unusual ingredients, make perfect sense. If, and if you're visiting uh, uh, Samsui or Sam's Island here in Denmark, visit the distillery, see for yourself, and not least taste for yourself, both the gin and the ants. So the next time you see an intrusive ant in your home, well, you could consider whether you wanted to put it in a juniper flavored alcohol and make your own gin or not. Number three. Here is another seafood inspired gin. This is lobster gin. And it's not only the Danes who are going crazy in unusual botanicals. Our Belgian friends are also going nuts. And here the ingredient is playing a major role in the gin, the lobster. And it's created by the Michelin star chef, uh, Christophe Maranis. Hope I pronounce your name right. Well, a lob a lobster gin is made by macerating lobster in alcohol for two days. 200 grams of alcohol, uh, sorry, of lobster goes into each bottle. So no wonder why you really can get this uh, seafood feeling in the gin. And that is exactly what the chef wanted, a clear lobster feeling to go with his lobster dishes. And for me, it becomes too much. It's too overpowering, especially as a gin and tonic, it's pretty weird. And I admit, I haven't tried it uh, as a gin and tonic together with uh, several different lobster dishes, so maybe this is an excuse for me to buy a huge lobster and try this lobster gin again. If you have any uh, thoughts on how I could serve this the best way, let me know in the comments below. And here's another one for you guys. Where do you keep your bottle of lobster gin? In the closet, of course. Oh, sorry. Number two. If seafood can be used, so can meat. So, meat butchers gin. And it seems like it's primarily the Danish and the Belgian distillers that are going bonkers when it comes to using uh, unusual ingredients. Here is another Belgian gin that will get your attention. As I said, this is Butcher's Gin. And this gin is made by the renowned Belgian artisan butcher, Luc de Latte. Uh, here he has used his famous ribeye steak, which has been dry aged for seven weeks with seven different herbs and spices. The meat has then macerated in 96% alcohol for three days before distilling it with um, botanicals and normal botanicals like juniper and cardamom and uh, coriander, uh, orange zest, uh, angelica, orris root and uh, black pepper. You know, it smells really meaty, slightly sweet like cured meat, and it seems in so many ways completely wrong. And you know what? It is. As a gin and tonic, I simply cannot see how this would ever work. But if you serve it as a red snapper, you know, the, the gin Bloody Mary uh, drink, it might work. But that doesn't cover the fact that this is a very strange uh, gin and a very strange ingredient to use. But I love having it in my collection. Collection, sorry. Number one. So what is number one? Something that is crazier than fine caviar, orange flavored jet ants, lobster, and uh, ribeye wrapped in herbs? Shit, it must be strange. Yep, exactly that. Shit. <laughs> the number one on my list of top five gin with unusual ingredients is gin with elephant shit. Droppings, manure, dung. Why the hell anyone would want to use dung in a gin? Well, if you ask the people behind the In Love Gin, 
in Lovo meaning elephant in several African languages, the reason is that elephants are very particular when browsing habitats for plants and leaves. And at the same time, very little of the plant material is actually digested by the elephant. So the dropping has a lot of, uh, a lot of flavors in it. So you can say that the largest land animal is actually foraging the gin botanicals for these guys. And before you close this video and throw up, it's important to say that the dung goes through a sanitation process before it's rinsed and dried and then made into a liquid that can be infused in the gin. And using dung for different things is not a new thing. As far as I know, it has been used for things like uh, being a mild uh, painkiller when you light the dong and you inhale the smoke while it burns. And it has been uh, used as a filler in holes in road, roads and now also as an ingredient in a gin. So what does dong taste like? Well, if you ask the distillery, it adds a uh, earthy, grassy kind of flavor to the gin. And these notes, of course, are something that goes uh, very well with the juniper berry. And to be honest, here at, how, at our house, we love this gin. We think it makes a great gin and tonic, served with a fever tree Indian tonic, a small piece of uh, lemon zest, and it's just so refreshing. It's a really classic gin and tonic, and it's so much fun to drink. And the gin is certainly a good conversational piece. So there you have it, my top five gins with unusual ingredients. And if you know of gins with weird ingredients, please leave a comment in the fields below. I would love to see and hear how crazy distillers are getting out there and maybe add to my own collection. Make sure to subscribe to uh, High on Gin's YouTube channel, Facebook, and Instagram so you won't miss the next episode of High on Gin. And remember, good friends offer advice, and real friends offers gin, even with elephant dung in it. See you next time.